Up next on today's Wild West, we'll ride the big sky country of Montana's Bonanza Creek Ranch, cross the wide Missouri on a historic Montana ferry, and spend the night on the other side in a homestead cabin. Plus, the Bozeman artist with a welding torch who creates belt buckles from barbed wire. It's all next, today's Wild West. The Wild West, it's still out there. And we'll show you how to find it. This is today's Wild West. Galloping flat out across the Montana plains. It's like a scene out of the old TV show Bonanza. But this is no Hollywood fantasy. This is what you get to do when you come to Bonanza Creek Ranch, 25,000 acres of wide open country and a real working cattle ranch. We're moving cows up on the Lewis and Clark National Forest. So this is called Dry Fork. And the next one we'll go to is Coach Pond. And then we'll move them up the hill from there. On a perfect summer day, owner June Voltseth leads our group of just 10 guests as we head out for a day of working cattle on a ranch that's been in the family since 1877. It's a real experience. There's nothing that's made up. It's a bona fide cattle ranch that's been in the family a long time, and that appeals to a lot of people. I like it. No nose to tell riding here, and as we go to find the cow-calf pairs we need to round up and move, there's time to have a little fun along the way as Wrangler Annie leads us on a nice long lope. This is a riding ranch, and Bonanza Creek only takes an intermediate and advanced riders. Good riders like to ride with good riders. Uh, it's hard to beat, that's for sure. This week that includes Thorsten and Stephanie Erickson and their friend Sophia, who own their own horses and ride English style back home in Sweden. So this western riding is all new to me. This will have to be my last riding trip because I could never top this. It's a small group. The ranch only takes eight to 12 guests at a time. I like people, but I'm not too crazy about crowds. So the eight to 12 guests is just right. I work for Checkerboard, which is just over the hill here. We arrive at the big section where the cattle are, where we meet two cowboys from the neighboring Checkerboard Ranch. Oh, we knocked her two today. Okay. I guess. Just kind of looking around. They're here to look in on the checkerboard cows that share the same pasture as June's cattle. You cowboy Couple a lot of different places, or? A lot of places, yep. Arizona, New Mexico, a uh, little bit in Nevada, California. Fellow hired hand Dennis Clemenson has been cowboying all over the American West for the last 40 years. What do you like best about cowboying? Oh. When I was younger, it was the running and roping. Now it's just kind of being away from people and things like that. So, but I'll get up here and make sure these cows go the right direction. Okay, good right. to meet you. You too. So uh, around this corner, there's a there's a, a hill up there, and we'll move the cattle up that hill. But we'll gather them. Um, we'll just kind of drop these there, and then we'll gather them. There's another coolie up there, and another one that way, and we'll gather all the cattle together and head them up the hill. Find the cows and move them out. Sounds simple enough. They stop at the trees and they won't go further. But it's not quite that easy. Get moving here. Go. She said we missed the road and we needed to get them up that way. Let's just collect them and try that road then. Well, it's the Wild West, huh? It takes a while, but nobody's in a hurry. We finally get the cows gathered into one group. There's a lot of cows out there. <laughs> and our mini cattle drive gets underway. As we push the herd up a hill. And into the next pasture. Fun stuff, even for those who get to do it every day. I love moving cows. Mm. <laughs> Our mission accomplished. We'll take a break for lunch, then head back to the ranch. Later, we take a side trip to the nearby ghost town of Castletown, the real Old West. A fascinating place to see and imagine what it was like here back in the day. What you doing, you little guy? Active dogs. 
Meanwhile, back at the ranch, another treat, border collie pups, an added bonus to cap off a magnificent day in Montana. As the sun rises on another day in paradise, we're in for a different kind of ride. No cow work today, just a nice long trail ride. 27 miles. We're lucking out once again with the weather as we head out into another perfect summer day, guided by June's brother-in-law, Larry. Now you can look back and see why your horse is sweating a little bit. Wow. Quite a climb. Get the horses to do it though. We do have the horses to do it. Many of which are registered quarter horses and striking American paint horses. Up here in the high country, oh, what a field up here. the views are spectacular. It's a good view of the ranch from here. If you see those trees going down where there's a creek bottom down there, that's a, called Cottonwood Creek. But the ranch goes just this side of Cottonwood Creek. Bonanza Creek is surrounded by mountains. We're in the north end of the crazies. That's the big belts up there with the snow. That's called Old Baldy. These are the Castle Mountains behind us. This high elevation is where the elk spend their summer, and along the trail we come across a curious young elk calf. Then maybe the mommy's there around here somewhere. Okay, there's some elk right there. I can hold it right there. Oh, look at that. Later we spot an entire herd of elk off in the distance. Huh. Quite a sight. All part of a great long day horseback, including some nice long lopes as well. This wide open country is the perfect place to unwind, relax. This is what you need. Yeah. Days out in the, uh, in the open. And perhaps reflect on the trail your life has taken, or whether you need a course correction. In recent years, Bonanza Creek has been hosting a growing number of retreats for women, couples, and other groups, helping people to discover and fulfill their potential. The sage, it just smells so good. It's pure aromatherapy. But any day at this ranch is therapeutic, inspiring, and just plain fun. Like our wagon ride out to the ranch hunting camp for an outdoor dinner, where we spotted a herd of antelope along the way. That's as close as we'll get to. The trip even included the chance to learn how to drive the team. Keep them in the middle. Okay, so slide your hands. There you go. Larry's been driving horse-drawn wagons since he was in high school. I told my dad, I said, gee, I'd like to learn how to drive a team while everybody, somebody's still alive that knows how about it. So we had a couple saddle horses and we hooked them up and I learned to drive. I've had teams ever since. He makes it look easy, but it's not. No, it's hard. Fun though, so, huh? It's fun. Yeah, cool. Yeah, very fun. Oh, there, a little face. A little face. Yeah. Or you can just sit back and enjoy the ride. What do you see? A the face. face. <laughs> a small stone face. Sure is pretty out here in wide open Montana. Enjoying life, lots of laughter as the sun goes down. <laughs> Whether it's on the wagon, sitting on a horse, or at the long lodge dinner table, laughter is always part of the soundtrack here. And one night, some guitar as well. June's husband, David, is quite the musician as well. I'd never be cross. Talented man with a great spirit, whose wheelchair you barely notice. This is the hand I've been dealt, so I have to deal with it. And there's different ways to deal with it. Some people give up and some don't. I was one of those that didn't. David was injured in a tractor accident in the 1980s. He still runs the ranch, but from a four-wheeler and a pickup truck instead of a horse. It hasn't slowed me down that much. It's because I'm a hard-headed Norwegian. I never give up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that. <laughs> I know every engineer on every train. Farm Journal magazine once did a story on David called Ranching from a New Perspective. Chances are you'll discover a new perspective when you come to Bonanza Creek. The attitude and the atmosphere is contagious. Whether it's soaking in the scenery, enjoying new friends, a fast ride on a great horse or a quiet retreat. You can't help but leave here refreshed. I'm sorry to leave tomorrow. And grateful for the chance to experience this magnificent part of the American West. Recharged for whatever may lie ahead on the trail. Till we meet again.
You might call it the Hearst Castle of the Montana Prairie, the Bear Family Museum. We'll take you for a tour of this amazing place coming up on today's Wild West. On a lonely highway outside the tiny and remote town of Martinsdale, Montana, population 64, you'll find an amazing museum left behind by a family with a story to match. As the years went by, they spent most of their time in their private quarters upstairs and in the kitchen because they really did start to think of this as the museum they were leaving. The Bear Family Museum is an eclectic collection of fine art, European antiques, Native American artifacts, and Western art, featuring original works by the legendary cowboy artist Charles M. Russell, who was good pals with the patriarch who started it all, Charles M. Bear. He was very frugal. He wanted to be a landowner, and he didn't own it right away. He just saved up to do it. The 11,000 square foot family ranch house is something like a Western Hearst castle. Its many treasures include antique gold-plated bathroom fixtures and original oils by French painter Edward Cortez. Their introduction to Cortez came when they ran into a friend in a lobby in a hotel in Paris who was, who was there to buy paintings for LBJ. There are crystal chandeliers, the finest fashions of the era, and a priceless Native American collection, just to name a few all provided by a man with very humble beginnings. Born into an Ohio farm family, Charles Bear arrived in Montana in 1883 as a 26-year-old conductor for the Northern Pacific Railroad. But the ambitious and hard-working young man was soon acquiring property and moonlighting as a sheep rancher on his first 320 acres. By 1891, Bear's ranch had grown to nearly 6,000 acres. He'd quit the railroad and become a full-time rancher, living in a sod-roofed two-room cabin with his wife and two-year-old daughter, Marguerite. And by the mid-1890s, Bear was ranching 40,000 sheep and had moved his family and business headquarters to Billings. But the real wealth you see in the Bear Museum today had its origins in the Great Klondike Gold Rush. Charlie Bear headed north to Alaska in the spring of 1898, and thanks to mining investments and equipment sales, returned home that fall a wealthy man. The money would allow Bear's wife and two daughters, Marguerite and Alberta, to enjoy a lifelong lifestyle of multiple homes, travel, and collecting art and antiques, especially during their later frequent trips to Europe. The more comfortable they became, the more worldwide travelers, they started going for the Louis XIV, 15th, 15th uh, commodes, and they would ship things back. Charlie Bear did some collecting of his own, purchasing three paintings from his pal Charlie Russell, whose illustrated letter to Bear can be seen today in the museum. Joseph Henry Sharp had a huge collection of shields hanging all over his cabin in Crow Agency, and for that reason, we think that they may have gotten this shield mm -hmm. from Joseph Henry Sharp. Bear was also a fan of Western artist Joseph Henry Sharp and bought the first five volumes of photographer Edward R. Curtis's acclaimed 20-volume work photographing the American Indian. These were original photogravures printed by the printer in Boston that he selected. Meantime, by 1910, Charlie Baird became the biggest sheep rancher in the world, shipping entire trainloads of wool out of Billings. They celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, Mr. and Mrs. Bear, in this room. Wintering in Los Angeles, the Bears became friends with silent movie star William S. Hart and the famed writer and artist Will James. Chief Plenty, who gave Alberta when she was that size, this Lakota vest. The Crow Indians were also among the friends of the Bears, on whose reservation Charlie Bear leased millions of acres to run his sheep. Charlie used to buy him these cars. He'd order them in Chicago and ship them out. He was a terrible driver, and he usually got driven around in Montana, but he liked to buy cars. By 1952, Charlie and Mary Bear had passed away. Marguerite, who married ranch foreman Dave Lamb, continued her European collecting trips with her sister Alberta, and they expanded the ranch house to 26 rooms to house their growing collection. You saw Mrs. Bear's hand-painted china, and you saw the influence she had on her oldest daughter in antiques they purchased. And you see Charlie's paintings that he bought from his friend Sharp and Russell, the photographs he bought from Curtis. So that was the parents. And then after the parents passed away, uh, they left two daughters, one of which has a, a very deep interest in art. They started to travel, and they collected a completely different kind of thing, antiques and silver and paintings. 
but they melded them all together in their family home. They didn't get rid of one to replace it with another. And I think that it's eccentric, but it's also, it's very heartfelt in a way. And I think it's what makes it so real. But neither sister had any children. And by the 1960s, they were already planning what to do with their estate. One of the unique things about the Bear Family Museum is that the family wanted their home left as a museum when they were gone. So when you walk in that house, you're seeing the home just as it was when the Bear family lived there. There was still salt in the salt shakers when I got here. Curator and director Elizabeth Guheen says while there are many family home museums in the United States, the Bear House is truly unique. In this case, the family literally left everything in situ. They created a trust and they left them the keys and said when the last family member is gone, this is for the public to come in and see as a museum. Alberta was the last of the family when she died in 1993. Operating under a trust, the Bear Home opened as a museum three years later. And in 2011, the newly constructed Charles M. Bear Family Art Museum opened, housing many of the collection's more historic and delicate possessions like its Native American treasures and original art. Charlie Russell knew Charlie Bear and Charlie Bear purchased those paintings from him and they haven't been out of this house since that time. So I think that very immediate connection between the artists and the family and the house, I think that that's really important. You know, there was no time passed that rewrote the story. It's the way they left it. The Charles M. Bear Family Museum is about two hours northwest of Billings or 90 miles northeast of Bozeman. Either way, it's a beautiful drive. And you can also visit the museum and see its fabulous collection on their website, which we've linked to our own. We'll have details later in the program. Hi, I'm Mark Bedore. Today's Wild West is along the Missouri River outside the tiny community of Virgil, Montana, where the only way to get across this river is on a ferry. The Missouri breaks, rugged, broken, and unspoiled country along the upper Missouri River in central Montana. Now protected as a national monument, this area is home to a thriving population of transplanted bighorn sheep, and a dirt road offers an adventurous drive through some very remote country. So remote, in fact, that when you get down to the river, you'll discover there's no bridge, only a ferry. What a beautiful spot you have. Yeah, it is. Jack Carr is our friendly ferry operator. We actually met Jack the night before when we drove down from our hotel in nearby Winifred to scout out the ferry. They planted bighorn sheep, reintroduced them here about 30, 35 years ago, and they are the predominant animal around here right now. Former school teacher enjoys running the ferry, calling it the least boring job he's ever had. It's just visiting with people is interesting. And I always ask, where are you going? Where are you coming from? Where are you going? And, and get a, you know, everyone's got a story to tell you. So, and they want to know about the history of, of the ferry. The original ferry was put in by homesteader Jack McClellan back in 1921, and the private operation was later sold to the Stafford family. Today, the Stafford McClellan Ferry is owned by the county, operating from the 1st of May to the end of November. There's a bridge upriver about 13 miles, and they just, they don't want to disrupt this section of the river. Did someone get up and cook your breakfast this morning? No. Eight to ten vehicles cross here on an average day, many of them tourists. But local ranchers use the ferry as well, which cuts off an hour on the trip to Billings for those who live north of the Missouri. We spent the night south of the river, 16 miles away, in tiny Winifred, Montana, population 205. All is quiet and deserted on a peaceful Sunday morning. And so is the road to the ferry. Nobody here but us and the rugged, beautiful wilderness. It's like having the whole world all to yourself. We've set out to see all three of Montana's Missouri River ferries. Upriver, there's the Carter Ferry just south of the small town of Carter, about 25 miles northeast of Great Falls. It crosses another quiet stretch of the river, traveled by Lewis and Clark on their epic journey more than 200 years ago. But first, we drove to Virgil, better known to locals as Virgil. After you've crossed the Missouri River on the Virgil Ferry, you can spend the night at one of the most unique B&Bs in the country and sleep in a restored homesteader cabin. Well, some people say, well, they get here, well, uh, who comes here? How do you sell anything? And, 
our location is probably our best asset. Don Sorensen grew up six miles away on the farm his brother still operates today. The grandson of Montana homesteaders, Don became a pharmacist instead of a farmer and had a lifelong interest in collecting and restoring antiques. I started restoring things on the family farm when I got out of pharmacy school and my dad thought I was crazy and I knew I didn't want to do farming and ranching. I didn't want to sit on a tractor and not talk to anybody. So, As a kid in the country, Virgil was a favorite spot for camping and picnicking. Don saw the post office here close in 1961, the general store went out of business in 1970, and the railroad shut down in the 1980s, leaving Virgil a ghost town. I'd filled up the attic of the barn at home, and, and I looked at this building once, and I, it was abandoned, I go, hmm. Don bought the abandoned store and spent three years restoring the downstairs into a shop for his antiques. First thing I did is open up this window here and park the truck down there, one and a half ton truck, and shoveled out two truckloads of plaster that had fallen to the floor. Upstairs, it took 10 years of work to transform the rooms where railroad workers once slept into what today is a beautiful bed and breakfast. But each room has, we've named it for somebody who's actually lived in Brazil. Or you can spend the night outside in one of Don's six authentic, meticulously restored homestead cabins all recovered and brought in from within a 40 mile radius of Virgil. I started restoring things on the family farm. There was a bunkhouse that was actually a homestead cabin and I drug all the stuff from the farm and fixed it up and I have moved it down here and then one thing led to another. Somebody came and says, there's some antiques in this cabin. This, we're gonna burn it down, do you want it? There's also a bed in the sheep herder's wagon. This is the old ice house where they used to harvest ice off the river. You wash up in the old ice house, converted into a state-of-the-art shower and bath. The cabins are all named after the homesteaders who built them. They were going to burn them down. The Mosiers were an Indiana family of three brothers who came west and built three cabins. We salvaged two of them. During restoration, Don found the love letters of a young girl. He tracked down the author, whose daughter brought the 80-year-old to come and see the cabin where she'd grown up. She went to her daughter and she says, you see this scar on my arm? Now she's 80 years old. I went to throw the wash water out that window and there was a nail there and she still had a scar. Entire families of five or six people once called these tiny structures home. It was tough. My grandma told me some horror stories only because I started questioning her and asking her. But there's a lot of stuff they don't like to talk about because they weren't the good old days. They were, they were tough. They were very tough. In the 1910s, Virgil was a thriving homesteader community named after its founder, Virgil Blankenbaker. After building the general store in 1912, he added a bank in 1917. But the bank closed just 10 years later and Virgil dwindled away. Today, the restored bank, the store, and the homesteader cabins have made Virgil a destination for both those looking for a unique overnight experience and antique hunters from all over the country. Everybody comes to my front door, which is kind of nice, so I don't have to go see the world. Don even owns the old grain elevator. I want to make a restaurant out of it and call it Good Grub at the Greeley, but I'll probably never get that done. But to get here, you have to use the ferry. And that in itself is a special treat. If nothing else, the short trip across the Missouri to Virgil and Montana's two other ferries force you to slow down, get out of the car, and experience what we so often miss in our busy lives. Probably one of the most beautiful places in the world here. The more I look upstream, the more I remember how pretty it is. Inside a rather ordinary steel building outside Bozeman is the studio of an extraordinary artist. A man who combines his creativity with his skill as a welder, creating what may be the most unique belt buckles in the West, celebrating the heritage of the great state of Montana. Designing is fun, but when you can design things that you like, that to me personally is, is more fun. Fun for all of us, just to look at the designs of Marty Kent. We do a lot of work with recycled materials. These are also turned into bottle openers, as you can see. Who's created dozens of different buckles, many of which incorporate a strand of real barbed wire. We've learned to weld it to the steel buckle back in such a way that it's, it's safe to wear. You won't snag a, a sweater or a shirt or 
they won't catch on things. Marty and his wife Barb are both fourth generation Montanans, descendants of ranchers and farmers. But there's something really, really neat about just the small snapshot of just the twist in the wire. To me, it's just a symbol of, of my heritage and my, you know, my home. But anyway, they begin as blanks. And then uh, after that, we just start to add, add the layers. This new career for the once retired Kent began when he went searching for a souvenir belt buckle at the Beartooth Motorcycle Rally in Red Lodge, Montana. As I was searching for my, my next big adventure, um, you know, we, we just noticed that uh, I was, you know, looking for a niche, of course, and, and uh, found that belt buckles were just hard to find. Always interested in art, Marty was a boy when his grandfather taught him how to weld. Today, the welding torch is his paintbrush that he uses to create on a canvas of steel. The more we worked, the more we built, the more we designed, the more we just, uh, you know, the more creative we tried to get it, just these things just kept happening. The buckles, the designs just kept coming. And, and we noticed that as we, as we marketed them, they just, we just kept selling them. Even as display racks are something to see, like this one made from some old tools. My father was a mechanic. Uh, so I, I grew up you know, learning how to how to turn wrenches. So wrenches to me just kind of have a this is a, again a part of my part of my past. So I, I really like the uh, uh, the idea of you know you incorporating mechanics into the belt buckles. American made with American steel, crafted with pride. One of the things I'm probably most proud of is that these buckles, once they're completed, finished, welded together that they are made from American steel, they're handmade, but that they're just good solid welded product. It's not a cheap, thin, tinny kind of a junk buckle. That's it for now. We're back next time with more cool stuff from today's Wild West. I'm Mark Bedore. We'll see you down the trail. For more information on the people and places featured in today's Wild West, or to order show DVDs and books, visit todayswildwest.com.